Praise God. You may be seated. We're going to get into the word. And, you know, I know the devil doesn't like what we're doing. And that's a good report for us. I know he doesn't like it. And whenever we declare the gospel of the kingdom, it is what threatens him. Because it exposes him. Whatever is light exposes things. Light exposes and the kingdom of God is the kingdom of light. As, as, as Paul says in Colossians 1 verse 13 and 14, he has conveyed us or translated us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son whom he loved. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. He's not taking us from darkness to darkness. He's taking us from darkness to light. Amen? Yeah, man, so the kingdom of God is a kingdom of light. And in 1 John 1 and verse 5, John says, This is the message that we have heard from him. And what is that message? That God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. No darkness at all. So the kingdom of light exposes the kingdom of darkness. And that is what we, were, we started talking about on Friday night. When we said the supernatural affects the natural. But in order to access the power of God, we must access it through faith. You get that? We must access it through for without faith, it is impossible to please God. So if we are not exercising faith, Paul said in Romans 14 and verse 23 or somewhere there, he says, whatever is not of faith is sin. Whatever is not of faith is, is sin. And we know that faith is the victory that overcomes the world. First John 4 and verse 4 to 6, first 4 to 5. Let us read that first John 4, first John chapter 4, from verse 4 to 5. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are of the world, therefore they speak as of the world, and the world hears them. Verse 6, the world hears them. We are of God. He who knows God hears us. He who is not of God does not hear us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. The spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Praise God. So we are talking about the power, there's power in the name of Jesus. And the, the supernatural affects the natural. And as I was saying, you know, there are times back in our lives where we can look at things happening or things happen to us that we did not understand what was happening. We blame it on circumstances. Some of us even blame it on God. Why would God allow this? And some of us say, boy, somebody went somewhere for us. You know? We said they went to the mother or father and work things against us. Not you? Yes, man. And we were thinking about those things. But Jesus came and unveiled something to us. He showed us that there, there's a force working behind the scene to keep humanity in bondage and to destroy humanity. Jesus puts it this way in John 10, verse 10. The thief comes but uh, the thief comes the thief does not come sorry except to steal and to kill and to destroy i have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly so we see jesus one of his purpose here been given in John 10 verse 10 and also we see what the devil has come to do 
And what does he come to do? He says he does not come. So there's no other reason why he comes here but to do these three things. To steal and to kill and to destroy. And we know that that's the worst kind of thief. Because sometimes persons steal things from us and they steal it. Persons steal because they are hungry and they want some food and they eat. But sometimes they steal things and that's one kind of thief. And the other one, he says, he comes to kill, to steal and to destroy. So some person, some will take the things and destroy it because they don't want you to have it. Some will take it because they're just envious and they want it, correct? While some will take it and they will destroy it because they don't want you to have it. And because they didn't have it, they take it from you and destroy it. But the devil, he says, is the worst kind of thief. He takes it from you, he destroys it, and he destroys you. He wants to destroy you. That's his purpose. That is his purpose. And he does not repent. The devil does not repent. So if you think that you can get a break from him or he's not coming back after you because I'm in Christ now. I'm, I'm in Christ now. I'm a good person now. I'm in church. I'm sitting and I'm worshiping God and I'm praising God. So he's not going to come after you. That's a sad mistake. Because he is coming and he has not changed his mind towards you. He has not changed his mind towards you. He still has one purpose. To steal, kill, and to destroy. So Jesus came to give us power over him. But as I said, there was a time when we were ignorant of this. We were helpless against him because we were under his control. But having, been, having believed the message of the gospel of the kingdom of God and receiving Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we have been delivered from the dominion of Satan. That's the kingdom of darkness. And have been conveyed into the kingdom of the Son of God. The kingdom of light. We have been set free. We have been set free. We have been set free by knowing the truth. Because Jesus said, it is the truth that sets you free. Lies does not set anyone free. Lies do not make us free. Lies keep us in bondage or keeps people in bondage. But Jesus said, it is the truth that sets you free. St. John 30, verse 32. We start from verse 30 where there were many Jews that believed on him as he spoke these words. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So what makes us free? And what does the truth make us free from? Sin. So Satan had us in bondage through ignorance. But then Jesus came and revealed the truth to us and set us free. And that truth, we must walk in that truth to stay in that freedom. We must walk in that truth too, to stay in that freedom. Because the moment we step away from truth, we are stepping back into the enemy's territory. Do you understand? So we have to walk in the truth, abide in the truth. It is not just that you come into truth and you say, I'm just here, yeah, I'm walking in truth now, but I can step out tomorrow and tell a little lie. And then he said, no, you have to be consistent in the truth. And the reason why many fall back into the trap of the devil is because they are not consistent in truth. They are not walking consistently in truth. But he wants us to walk consistently in truth. God wants us to walk consistently in truth. We see that in 3 John. 3 John 1, where John was talk right into the church and he said, I rejoice greatly to see my children walking in truth. 1 John, sorry, 3 John 3. For I rejoiced greatly when Bridget came and testified of the truth that is in you just as you walk in truth. So it's not just to believe the truth or know the truth. You have to walk in the truth. And walking in the truth reveals 
all the, the benefits and the results that truth give. If you go down further, you see he keeps talking about that. Verse 4, he says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. Isn't that what God requires of us? Is John writing this of himself? It's the Holy Spirit leading him. So this is God speaking directly to us. He said, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in truth. Because if we are not walking in truth, we are under the control of the devil. And the devil has nothing good in store for any of us. That's why we must be consistently walking in truth. And Paul says we, we should stand fast, therefore, in this liberty. Galatians 5 and verse 1. Galatians 5 and verse 1. He says, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free. And do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. This is a warning that he's given to the, to the church at Galatia. He said, you must stand fast, therefore, in this liberty. Stand in it. Be consistent in it. Abide in it. In the liberty by which Christ has made us free. And do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. The enemy had us under bondage, but he says, no, do not go back to that bondage. Praise God. Jesus, and Paul said in 2 Corinthians 3, verse 17, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. There is liberty. Ignorance has been one of the tools the enemy used to keep persons bound and in bondage for years because they did not know the truth and they did not want to know the truth. And when persons are lacking in truth, the enemy has a field day with them. When they are lacking in truth, the enemy has a field day with them. And God doesn't want that for any of his children. He doesn't want that for us. That's why Jesus came. He says, I am the truth. I am the way. I am the life. I came to set you free from the devil. So ignorance was working against us at one point in life. And we see from an Old Testament perspective, the people did not understand that there was a force working behind the scene against them. One prime example is the story of Job. Job was a faithful man, a righteous man, a perfect man. But what Job did not understand that all the tragedies that hit his life was because Satan went to God and said, listen, does Job fear you for nothing? I want to test Job. I want to show you that, listen, Job, Job is only worshipping you and loving you because of the things that you have given to him. But was that so? Was Job only loving God and worshipping God because of the things that he had? No. But what Job did not understand is that there was a force working behind him. So we go to Job um, 1 verse 9 and he says, so Satan answered and said, does Job, sorry, Job fear God for nothing. Have you not made a hedge around him, his household, and all that he has on every side? You have blessed him, the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But now stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your hands. So was it the Lord that did it? Okay. It was Satan that did it. But he did it because God said, I'm going to allow you. I'm going to show you something. So the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not lay hand 
on his person. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. Now, there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in the oldest brother's house. Continue. And a messenger came to Job and said, the oxen were plowing and the donkeys were feeding beside them. When the Sabians raided them and took them away, indeed they have killed the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. Now I want you to pay close attention to what is happening here. I want you to pay close attention. The oxen were feeding, and the Sabians came, killed the servants, and carried away the oxen. Correct? While he was still speaking, another also came and said, The fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I alone have escaped to tell you. I want you to pay close attention to verse 16. He says, The fire of God fell from heaven and burnt up the sheep. Let's go back to 14, 15, and 16 and look at those three verses together. 14, 15, and 16. The messenger came to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys were feeding beside them. When the Sabians raided them and took them away, what did they do to the donkeys and the oxen? They took them away. All right. They have killed the servants with the sword, edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, verse 16 says, Another also came and said, The fire of God fell from heaven and burnt up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I alone have escaped to tell you. Now, when I, I, when I looked at this, I was looking at it for, for a long time, and the Lord showed me something. You see, the, the, the donkeys and the oxen were taken away, but the sheep were burnt up. And the messenger is saying, the fire of God came down from heaven and burnt up the sheep. You see, sheep are what you call a represent, representative of our relationship with God, sheep and shepherd, correct? No, Job... Job, uh, this, the devil wanted Job to put blame on God that God was destroying what he had and his possessions. God does not destroy sheep. God does not destroy sheep. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. Do you get that? No, when, when I asked the Lord the question, why he said they, they took away the donkeys and the oxen, but they killed. He said the fire of God fell from heaven and burnt up the sheep. You see, whatever is symbolic or representative of your relationship with God, the devil wants to destroy. Anything that is symbolic or representing your relationship with God. Because Job would have used the, the sheep in sacrifices and burnt offerings to the Lord. And he's saying, he wants to put in Job's mind that, listen, what you're using in worship to God, God kill it. But, but Job, Job, wasn't, Job wasn't looking at it this way. Let's go down further and we hear what Job says. Verse 17. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, the Chaldeans formed three bands, raided the camels and took them away. Why they didn't kill the camels? But they took them away. Yes, and killed the servants with the edge of the sword. And I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, Your sons and your daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. What happened after that? Verse 19. And suddenly a great wind came from across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house. And it fell on the young people, fell on the young people, and they are dead. And I alone have escaped to tell you. It's always one message that is left to come and tell you, tell Job. Then Job arose, tore his robe, and shaved his head, and fell to the ground and worshipped. And what did he say in verse 21? 
And he said, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I, I shall return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job did not sin, nor charge God with any wrong. But was it God that took them away? Who took them away? Satan. But you see, Job did not understand that a counsel was held against him. There was a force working against him. And that's why I said there are things that would have happened in our lives. And we thought, this is just chance. This is just happenings. It's just bad luck. It's just bad luck. But we, we were not aware that there was evil working behind it to keep us bound, to keep us entrapped, to keep us in a state of ignorance where we'll always be on a, on, in ignorance or just going about, just thinking about luck or chance or luck or chance or, or, or saying, we just bad lucky. But God wants you to understand that, listen, there was a force working against you. So when Jesus came, Jesus revealed that there was a force working against us. Job didn't understand that point, that there was a force working behind the calamities. He didn't know that his name was brought up in a meeting and that permission was given to the devil to test what was in him. But the kingdom of God... The kingdom of God is now revealing to us that there's a, be there's a being behind all the evil and ill in the world. That's what the kingdom of God reveals. And when Jesus came, when he came and he said it in Mark chapter 1, Mark chapter 1 verse 14 and 15, he says that this time John was put into prison. Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and, he's, and saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. So he came with that message and he says, repent and believe in the gospel. The gospel comes with revelation. It comes with revelation and power. And we are going down to verse 23. We're going down to verse 23 of Mark chapter 1. I'm going to show you what Jesus revealed to them. Now there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit. There was a man in their synagogue. All this time they were in the synagogue worshiping. And there, were, there was a man in there with an unclean spirit. But nobody was say, oh, he's just sick or he's just... Not himself to the earth. It's just regular thing. But Jesus came and revealed something. And they said, let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Continue. Verse 25. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, be quiet and come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had convulsed, which means he was tearing and ripping and violently um, tossing that, that, that man, he convulsed and cried out with a loud voice, and he came out of him. This is the point that this is what they did not know based on what they said. Then they were all amazed. So that they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority he commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. With authority he commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. They have never seen this done before. They never heard of Abraham 
Isaac, Jacob, Samuel, or any one of those patriarchs or great men casting out devils or having authority or demonstrating that authority over unclean spirits. But when Jesus came, he's showing them that, listen, I not only command holy angels, but I have authority to command and to, and they will obey me, the kingdom of darkness as well. I have authority over them. So when he came with this revelation, he came with the kingdom and he shows them that the kingdom of God has power and authority over the kingdom of darkness. That's why they're asking, what new doctrine is this? They're saying, what new teaching is this? We have never seen it before. And he says, he did not just only command them. He says, with authority. With authority. And you cannot get that authority in sin. You cannot have that authority because they said, we have never seen this before. He commands even unclean spirits and they obey him. So he came and demonstrated that power. And he's now saying that, he, I'm not just telling you that the kingdom of darkness is working against you, but I'm giving you power to disarm the principalities of evil and disarm the workings of the kingdom of darkness. So he says, I'm demonstrating this power, but I'm giving you this power as well. Praise God. Before Jesus came, people thought it was just chance, misfortune, but they did not know that it was a deliberate, well-orchestrated plot to steal, kill, and destroy. John 10 verse 10. But Jesus came and pulled away the curtain and revealed the force behind it and said, I can give you power over him. I can give you power over him. Do you want that power? I can give you power over him. But first, I must teach you some things. And I must walk through some things. Now, this is the point where many persons stop. Because as we have been taught here in this ministry, Jesus is called the last Adam. Correct? All right. So the first Adam came and was given power, but he wasn't tested. God gave him the kingdom in Genesis 1 verse 26. He said, God said, let us make man in our own image, in our likeness. Let us make him and let him have dominion. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So man was given authority and dominion and power over the earth, correct? But he wasn't tested. So when the enemy came, and before he could come into what God wanted him to come into, he fell, and man sinned. And because he sinned, all that came after him sinned, and now everyone was under the, the control of the kingdom of darkness. We are under his control. That's why Jesus came to deliver us from that. Do you understand? So he said, man was given authority, but he wasn't tested. But Jesus came and he said, listen, I, am, I have come, but I'm going to go through some things and walk through some things and show you how to live this life. So he just didn't come and just start demonstrating power just so. He was tested. He was, all right, sounds like you don't believe me, but I can show you. I'm happy the word of God has it. Luke 4, Luke 4 verse 1, Luke chapter 4, we're going to read from 1 going to about 10 or somewhere there. Then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness being tempted for 40 days by the devil. Was he tested? He was tested. And in those days he ate nothing and was afterward, when 
and ate nothing. And afterward, when he had, when they had ended, that's the 40 days of fasting, he was hungry. He was what? Praise God. Verse 3. And the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. He always comes with something like that. When he came to Eve, he said, Did God really say he has not changed? So he said, If you are the Son of God, trying to put doubt in Jesus' mind, command this stone to become bread. He wants Jesus to use his power to satisfy his flesh, satisfy his hunger. But Jesus answered him, saying, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word, but by every word of God. So he's saying, yes, I'm hungry and I want food. But if God did not give me the command to turn stone into bread, I'm not going to do it because it's not just bread alone I live by. I live by every word that comes from God. So if God did not give me that command, I am not going to do it. Was he hungry? He was hungry. 40 days. I've never gone through it. I've never done it. Praise God. But <laughs> Apostle has done it. God, and, and trust me, we see the power that comes from that. And if God doesn't tell you to do that, don't, don't do it. Don't, please don't. Hear, hear, hear me. If you don't hear anything else I say today, if God doesn't tell you to do it, don't do it. So, he was hungry. He was hungry. And he says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. So that was one. The, then the devil taking him up on a high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And what did the devil say? And the devil said to him, all this authority I will give you and their glory for this has been delivered to me and I give it to whomever I wish therefore if you will worship before me all will be yours what is he saying here you can get a shortcut to the glory and the kingdom you, I can give you a shortcut yes, and because Jesus came for the kingdom he came for it he said in Luke 10 or 19 verse 10, he says, The Son of Man came to restore that which was lost. And it's not only the kingdom that was lost, but man was lost. So the devil knew that he came for the kingdom. And he's saying, you don't have to go through all that pain and suffering. You don't have to go through the chastening and, and men will beat you and whip you and tear your skin and the ridicule and the cross. You can bypass all of that and just give me a worship and I will give it to you. But would it stop there? And that's what many persons don't understand. Some take the shortcut and they get some things. But when you get things from the devil, he's coming back for it. And you are under his control. And Jesus answered and said to him, Get behind me, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God. And him only you shall serve. So Jesus is saying to us, if you want the kingdom, what you must do? Worship the Lord your God. And him only you shall serve. Because you're not getting it any other way. Praise God. Let's go down. Then he brought him to Jerusalem set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, he's quoting scripture, he's quoting Psalm 91. He said, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you and in their hands they shall bear you up lest you dash your foot against a stone so jesus knew that he had angelic protection but the devil wanted him to say you know just because just 
Test God. Tempt God. Show yourself, Lord. Show them that you are the Son of God. Show them that you have the power. Show them that if you throw yourself down, angels will come and catch you. And what did Jesus say? Jesus answered and said to him, It has been said. In other words, it is written, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. In other words, not because you know that God has given you angelic protection, you're going to throw yourself in danger and say, yes, God said angels are, uh, will catch me in their hands. So let me just go there and put myself in danger. Don't put your head in lion's mouth and dare the lion to bite you. It will take off your head. Don't go in isolated areas, secluded areas, where you know danger lurks. And say, no, I'm a child of God. I can walk through the valley of the shadow of death and nothing. Yes, go on. You might meet upon some things that take you out before your time. Because the devil can take you out before your time. He can. And we have seen and heard it. We have seen and heard it. So Jesus used the word of God. So we see that Jesus was tested. He was tested. He didn't just come and say, I am the son of God. I have the kingdom. And just do it and go. No, he was tested. And then verse 40. Let's, verse 30. Thank you. He said, now when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. So he's still coming back. Remember I tell you, the devil will not repent. Then Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee and news of him went throughout all the surrounding region. Continue, verse 15. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. So he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, saying, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. Do you see that? He came to do what? Set at liberty those who are oppressed. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. So he returned in the power of the Spirit. And that is what many people are lacking today. They want to do this work. They want to preach. They want to preach about the kingdom. But they are lacking the power of the Spirit. And they are involved in things that are against the Spirit of God. So they will do things, and they believe in Jesus' name. They can do things, but they do not have the life that he wants them to have. And because they do not have the life, he will say, I never knew you. But Jesus didn't just talk about the kingdom. He didn't just do, um, demonstrate the power. He lived the life. He lived the life that showed that he is the Son of God. So he returned in the power of the Spirit. And he declared that this is why he came. He was anointed to preach the gospel to the poor. He was sent to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. And to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. So he went through the testing. He went through all of that. And he came out with power and authority. And so when he came out, he said, listen, 
I can teach you how to demonstrate this power and this authority. But it doesn't just come like that. There's, there are some things that you have to endure. There are some things that you have to go through. It's called chastening. It's called preparation. It's called training. That is what many persons are lacking. They do not want to go through the training. They just want to call on Jesus and ride on other persons anointing and think that they can get through by doing that. And we see an example of that in Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19, I believe it starts at verse 11 or verse 12. Acts chapter 19. All right, let's read. Let's, let's, we start there. Yes. And this continued for two years, so that all who dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. Now God worked, verse 11, now God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul. Yeah, verse 11 is where we want to start. Now God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul. And these, what is this, what Paul calls in 2 Corinthians 12, the, the signs of an apostle. And he says, so that even handkerchiefs and aprons were brought from his body to the sick, and the diseases left them, and the evil spirits went out of them. You see that Paul wasn't there physically, but handkerchiefs and aprons were brought from his body to the sick, and diseases left them, those who they put them on, and the evil spirits went out of them. Verse 13. Then some of the itinerant Jews, itinerant means these are persons who are traveling, traveling Jews, they are traveling all over the place. Itinerant Jewish exorcists took it upon themselves. What did they do? Took it upon themselves. And I don't want you to miss that. They were not called to do it. They were not appointed to do it. They took it upon themselves to call on the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits. Remember, Jesus said, we don't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. The writer here is telling us that they didn't receive a word to do this. They didn't receive a word. They took it upon themselves to call on the name of the Lord. And it is not wrong to call on the name of the Lord, but look what they were doing. This is what he said they took it upon themselves to do. It is not that they took it upon themselves to call on the name of the Lord. Don't get it twisted. They took it upon themselves to call on the name of the Lord over those who had evil spirits. Do you understand? Good. So he says, saying, we exorcise you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. You see that? By the Jesus. They did not say by Jesus. They are saying the Jesus, which is something indirect. They don't know him, but they took it upon themselves to speak to evil spirits in the Jesus who Paul preached. Do you see the error there? We exercise you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. They did not know him. Also, there were seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest who did so. There were more than seven persons doing so. But he says, also. If he says, also, it means that they were not the only ones. Do you understand? Carry on. Verse 15. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know. Do they know him? Of course they do. And Paul I know. Do they know Paul? Of course they do. But who are you? You see, what we need to understand is that they, they know them. They know who they were. But they know that they were not in Christ. That they did not have the authority. It's like asking, who are you to tell me what to do? 
That's what they were asking. Who are you? What authority do you have to tell me to come out of this man? The man, then the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, overpowered them, and prevailed against them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. This became known both to all Jews and Greeks dwelling in Ephesus and fear fell on them all and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. So because they see us doing some things and oh, we can do that too. It doesn't take much to go up and say a few words and you know pray and we see things happening but that is not so. Jesus said you must have authority to do this because if you are doing it without God, when the devil comes to beat you you think it's just coming up here and speak a few words? You think I just come up here and speak a few words? Ah, oh, you better understand. Warfare has to take place. This is not something you get up and do. If God has not called you to this, sit down and take your training. Sit down and take your teaching. And what people don't understand is that when I came into this ministry, I came in here with 14 years of ministry. I came here with a bachelor's degree in theology. That's what I studied. And the Lord says, sit yourself down and be trained. And when they were talking and said, why is he sitting down with this man? Daily he comes to this place and sit down. But if they heard what God said to me, they would have done the same thing. And some of them have heard and they're still not doing it. But when you walk in obedience to God, when you obey God, when you live by what comes from God's mouth, and God says, no, it's time to put you up. You are not just coming with words. You are not just coming, but you're coming with anointing and power. And you're coming with authority because you have gone through the training you have gone through the training and they want to do it without training. And that is why there are so many churches in mess today. Because you have persons out there fly by night. They want to lead people. They want to influence people. But they themselves have not been trained and equipped and anointed and prepared for it. And if they are unprepared, the same thing will happen to them. So we are, not, we are not doing this just because, oh, we are here and we have nothing else to do. I've heard that many times. They don't have nothing else to do. Hmm. Praise God. So he came and he gave us that authority. They did not have that authority. They did not know Jesus. There are some things people can do in Jesus' name and still not know him. There are some things they can do in his name, but they still don't know him. Matthew 7, and we, we love to use this one because God is showing them that this one, it is not just calling upon Jesus' name. Matthew 7, 21 to 23. And I know the devil doesn't like to hear this, but we are here to expose these schemes because people think that they can just call upon the name of Jesus and do things and live any how they want to live and they will escape. Not at all. He says, not everyone who says to me, and this is, not, this is not Matthew just writing some words. This is coming from Jesus' mouth because you see the me is capitalized there. Do you see that? Not everyone who says to me, Jesus, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But what? He who does the will of my Father. You see the my there is capitalized again. The M is capitalized. It says, the will of my Father in heaven. So Jesus directly is saying, this is coming from Jesus' mouth, that everyone who says, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. So he's telling us, it's more than just calling upon my name. 
but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. And the will of God is not to sin. The will of God. Sin is nowhere in the will of God. In fact, God hates sin. And he will completely wipe out all those who are in sin. You better understand that. He says, many will say to me, look at the me there, in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? Jesus didn't say they didn't do those things. He didn't say they didn't do it, you know, but this is more important. He said, listen, then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So he said, doing those things won't get you access into heaven. John did no miracles. And John is in heaven. These do miracles and they, they were told to depart. Why? Because it's not about demonstration of casting out devils and prophesying and doing wonders. It is about living the life of the kingdom. And the life of the kingdom is not, it does not involve sin. There is no sin in him. So anyone who is practicing sin does not know him and he does not know them. And we have the word of God to show you that 1 John 2, 1 John 2, 3 to 6 and 1 John 3. Let's go to 1 John 2 first. 1 John 2 from verse 3 down to verse 6. By this we know that we know him. So John is not leaving it to chance. He says, this is how we know that we know him. If we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him and does not keep his commandment is a what? Is a liar. You know, back in denomination, they say, you're a young Christian, you're a young believer, you just start out. Give us some time, drop off the sin one by one, the bad habits one by one, until you come to that place. John is saying, no, whether you're young or old, whether you have been in this one week or ten years, if you say you know him, and you do not keep his commandments, you're a liar. That's what he said. And the truth is not in you. But whoever keeps his word, whoever does what? Truly, this means without a shadow of doubt, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this, we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought himself. And I learned in English that they say ought is the strongest English word when it comes to command. It says ought himself also to walk just as he walked. Just as he walked. So we go to 1 John 3. And John is not mincing words. He's not... He's not careful about how persons feel or think about this to water it down or to soothe persons. He's telling you just as it is. He said behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. Therefore the world does not know us. Why? Because it did not know him. The world does not know him. And why is that? Because the world is still under the sway of Satan. They are still in sin. He says, beloved, we know we are children of God. When? No, we are children of God. And we are children of God because we obey God. And it, is, it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. So we, don't, we have never seen God. We don't know what he looks like. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him, what do they do? Purifies himself. How much? Just as he is pure. So can you be just as pure as Jesus is pure? 
Yes, the word of God says it. Continue reading. He says in verse 4, Whoever commits sin also does what? Commits lawlessness. And what is lawlessness? What is sin? Sin is lawlessness. So you see why Jesus told them, I never knew you. Because you're practicing lawlessness. It doesn't matter how long they have been in church. It doesn't matter how long they, we have to emphasize that point. It doesn't matter how long they have been say, saying they are serving God. Because we, I used to be of the mindset that those who are in God longer than I am are, are more spiritual than I am. And there are certain things that you expect them to get and you are not yet qualified for it because of your years in ministry. But God is saying that's not how it works. That is not how it works. If they are in sin, no matter how long they have been in the church, whether pastor, usher, deacon, or sister Jane, whoever they are, if they are in sin, they don't know God. And God doesn't know them. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins. And in him, there is no sin. Do you see that in verse 5? It says, whoever, it means whoever you are, whoever abides in him does not sin. Full stop. Whoever sins has neither seen him nor known him. Full stop. That's it. He's not, he's not leaving it to your imaginary to say, I wonder if this is what John meant. Let's go to the Greek or the Hebrew lexicon and find the root word of this meaning, of the meaning of this word to see if, he, if it has another. John said, no, plain old English. Whoever abides in him does not sin. Whoever sins has neither seen him nor known him. It's not whoever sinned because all of us sinned. But he says, this sin here is a present continuous thing that they sin and they keep on sinning. And John says, if they do that, they are children of the devil. Verse 7. Little children, let no one deceive you. Because John, Jesus told them that in the last days, false prophets will arise and deceive many. Matthew 24, do you remember that? So he says, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous. Do you remember that? Just as in, in chapter 2, same thing. John is not double tongue. It's one message. Just as he is righteous. He who sins is of the devil. Why? For the devil has sinned from the beginning. And from him started no stop. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested. That he might destroy the works of the devil. Look at verse 9. They don't like to hear this one, but it's the word of God. Whoever has been born of God does not sin. For, the seed, for his seed remains in him. And he cannot sin because he has been born of God. Give me verse 10. In this the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. No, I was one of those preachers that think that everybody are children of God. Some are bad and some are good. I was of that mindset. Until God gave me the truth and the revelation that, listen, there are children of the devil and there are children of God. And how do we know the difference? He says, whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God. Nor is he who does not love his brother. So if they are in sin and they are practicing sin, are they children of God? No, they are not. And you can stand on that word and you can declare that word and you can tell them the word of God says so. It is what the word of God says. So Jesus came to give us, to give us this revelation. He came to show us that, listen, I can give you power over sin. I can give you power 
over the flesh. I can give you power and authority over the devil. But you have to come into me. You have to come in me. Abide in my word. So when he went through all the tests, when he went through the sufferings, and his body was pierced and beaten, and they did all manner of evil to him, he, God raised him from the dead. And gave him all, all authority. That's why he said to his disciples in Matthew 28, Matthew 28, verse 18. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Remember, we started by saying authority and power was given to Adam, but he was not tested. But Jesus went through the test, prevailed and said, listen, I have all authority and all power has been given unto me, both in heaven and in earth. Go, therefore. And this going, therefore, he said, because you are in me and I have this authority, you have this authority as well. So he's sending us in his authority and in his power. He says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. When he says, I am with you always, even to the end of the age, that gives us a boldness and a confidence that if God be for us, who can stand against us? And when you know that God is for you and working in you, you have this boldness and this confidence to declare the message, whoever you come upon, whoever stands against you will not prevail. And Jesus said, this is not about just killing the body or they won't prevail against you. They may prevail. He said, don't fear those who can kill the body. So they may kill your body. But he says, they cannot kill what is in you. The life that is in you, they cannot destroy. So he says, don't fear them. Because one day this flesh will be put off. One day this flesh will be put off. And that is what the kingdom of God came to reveal to us. Because in the Old Testament, in, in, in Ecclesiastes, Solomon was talking about, you know, the grave is the end for the righteous and the sinner. So what point is there in this life? For the righteous die and the sinner die and they go to the grave. But then God reveals that, listen, there is life beyond this. And God gave Job a glimpse of this. That's why Job says, even though worm destroy this flesh yet with mine eyes I will see him for I know that my redeemer lives so Job was prepared that listen even when this body drops and worm destroys it yet with mine eyes I will see him so he was not fearful that's why when he lost everything he said listen I am not worried about it I am not worried about it because he knew that one day he would see his Redeemer. One day he would see God. So he came to demonstrate this power. And he gave us this power. But this power does not come without his word and the Holy Spirit. So he tells them, you shall receive power. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you, Acts 1 verse 8. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses, or witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. You, are, you shall be witnesses unto me. And God wants us to spread the message of the gospel. God wants us to be witnesses of Christ and his work in our lives. But you cannot be true witnesses in sin. You cannot be true witnesses. The report will be tainted. And then as Paul says, the name of God will be blasphemed among the Gentiles. Because if you're saying one thing and doing another, then your, your witness has no credibility. It cannot be trusted. That's why he said you must be consistent 
in him, abiding in him, walk in him, walk in truth consistently because we are no longer under the dominion of darkness. We are under the, the, the power and authority of God. When we were under the dominion of darkness, we were not obligated to righteousness. Paul talks about that in Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6, Paul says, listen, when you were there, you had no obligation to righteousness. You did what your sinful nature wanted you to do. Romans chapter 6, we start at verse 15. Romans chapter 6, we start at verse 15. And he says, what then? Shall we sin? Because we are not under law, but under grace. Certainly not. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one slaves whom you obey? Whether of sin leading to death. What does sin lead to? Death or of obedience leading to righteousness. So can you obey both at the same time? No. Good. He says, but God be thanked. That though we were, did he say were? And were is past tense. He says, were slaves of sin. So all of us were slaves of sin. Yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. Jesus came with the doctrine. Jesus came with that teaching that delivered us from the dominion of darkness and conveyed us into his kingdom. So he says, upon your obedience of the message, you were delivered. And having been set free, verse 18, having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. So we have to be slaves to somebody. We have to be under the authority of somebody. We are never left to ourselves. You know, that was an interesting thing the Lord showed me many years ago. That you are never left to yourself to do what you want to do. You're always obeying somebody. Always. Whether God, righteousness, lead, uh, whether obedience to God leading to righteousness, our disobedience, our sin leading to death. You're always, we are always obeying somebody. But he says, having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. What does verse 19 say? Verse 19. I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented, it's not the devil make you do it, you present, you presented your members as slaves of uncleanness and of lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness. So now present your members as slaves of righteousness to holiness. Because obedience, when you obey, it means, it means that you had a choice. You had a what? A choice. Yes, you had a choice in doing it. So that's why he says, you presented yourself. You present, if it's forced, it's not obedience. You presented yourself as slaves of uncleanness and of lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness. So now present your members as slaves of God, of slaves of righteousness for holiness. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. That is what I was saying. You had no obligation to righteousness when you were slaves of sin. That's why we cannot expect anything less from sinners than to sin. You get it? Because they have no obligation to righteousness. You were free in regard to righteousness. But Paul is saying, listen, what fruit did you have then in those things which you are now ashamed of? For the end of those things is death. Continue. But no, having been set free from sin, were you set free from sin? Yes. And he says, and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit now to what? Holiness. And the end? Everlasting life. That means there's an end result to all of this. 
For, this is the conclusion, for the wages of sin is death. The reward, the payment, the end of sin is death. But the gift of God is what? Eternal life. And where is this life? In Christ Jesus, our Lord. Is he Lord? Yes, he is our Lord. So he says the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So that is what he came to give us. He came to give us eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And John says, no, we are of God. We are of God. He says in 1 John 4, verse 4, you are of God, little children, and have overcome them. Because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. So if God is in you, fear shouldn't be a part of your vocabulary. If God is in you, sin definitely is not a part of your life. If God is in you, failure is not a part of your life. If God is in you, there's nothing that should represent the desires and the passions of the flesh that lead you back into sin. Because you are now a new creation. What did Paul say? We are now a new creation. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, that's 2 Corinthians 5, 6, give me 16 and 17. Because I want to show you something there. He says, therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. Is he saying we don't see flesh and blood anymore? No, he's not saying that. But he said we don't just look at you as flesh and we don't regard you according to the flesh. So we are not connected to you by flesh. We are not connected to you by carnal means. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, it that he came in the flesh, but he says, yet now we know him thus no longer. Why? Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. All things have passed away. He says, passed away. That's a perfect action that was done in the past. Passed away, done. Behold, all things have become new. So there's a newness. Hallelujah. Do you believe that? You have to believe in this newness to walk in it. Because if you say that you are new, but you're not walking as having this new life, then your life is a walking contradiction. So if you believe and you say that you are new, we must see the life that shows that you are new. Because you have died with Christ. You were buried with him through baptism. And you were raised to new life. Just as he was raised from the dead, you were raised to new life that you should walk in newness of life. The reference to that is in Romans 6 verse 3 to five walk in newness of life so god gives us this authority and this power but it does not come cheap it does not come cheap paul says or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into christ were baptized into his death so he says, when he baptized you, when he put you down, it was representing of the death. You are dead and buried. Buried with him. That's why we put you under the water. And if we left you under there, one more heaven, one more gone straight to heaven. But he says, no, you must come back up now and demonstrate the life. That's what he said in verse 4. Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death. But it did not just leave us there. That just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so, you see that even, even so, we also should what? Walk in newness of life. So the old life is dead. That's what he's saying. You died to that life. 
And you must walk in newness of life. So he said in verse 5, For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Verse 6, and he says, Knowing this, this is something that you should know. And what is that? That our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be what? Done away with. That we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. I heard a preacher remark some time ago that his, his mother died and his mother died owing some debts. So when they debtors came calling they say he quoted this verse <laughs> for he who has died is free from sin you're free from death you're dead so paul paul is saying here if you died with him that means the old man is dead you are raised to new life and we must walk in that new life no we be, we know if we died with christ we believe that we shall also live with him. Verse 9. Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also Reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let's keep it right there and look at that. He says, even as Christ died and was raised again, you were raised again. And he says, even as he died once, you must die once to sin. Do you get that? Yes, he said, once for all. And now he lives to God. He's saying the likewise. The likewise there is saying just as he died to sin once for all, but lives to God. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also, you must die to sin. Christ died to sin once for all. You reckon, must reckon yourselves be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Do you see that there? Yes, man. So God wants us to demonstrate the power. But the power comes through life. The power comes through this life. Because if we are doing things for God, but we don't have this life, we will end up like the ones who Jesus said, depart from me. I never knew you. So it's not just about having power. It is about the life. Because even if you never do one miracle in your life, if you are living for God, you are just as powerful and as qualified for the kingdom of God as anyone else who is doing it and living the life. It's not about doing the miracles. It's not about casting out devils. It's not about speaking in tongues. It's not about prophesying. It is about doing the will of the Father. And the will of the Father is not for us to sin. That's not his will. He came that he may dis might destroy the works of the devil. And what is the works of the devil? Sin. So he came to destroy it. And if he destroyed it, why should you keep doing it? Stand to your feet. We're going we're gonna to pray. We're, we're going to pray because the, the devil doesn't like when we declare this word, but too bad for him. We are going to keep declaring this word because the more we declare this word, Jesus said, what I tell you in secret, speak openly. What I whisper in your ears, proclaim it on, on the mountain or the house top. So he wants us to proclaim this message. And he says, when you are pro proclaiming this message, don't be fearful of those who can kill the body. But after that, they can do nothing. 
Because he wants us, he, the devil wants us to think that, oh, you know, if you speak this message, the Lord woke me up Thursday night and said, pray. Pray for your son and pray over the ministry. I did not know that I was going to preach Friday night. I did not know. But the Lord said, pray, cover. The last time the Lord came to me when I was about to preach and said, cover your son. I remember I, I saw a spirit come in a church that I was at. And, and the, the, you know, the, the person that it came in said to me, if you preach that sermon, I'm going to kill your son. And I said, the devil is a liar. So when, I, when the Lord come and say, cover him and pray over the ministry and, and pray, I knew that something was coming because the devil doesn't like what we are doing. And as long as he doesn't like it, as long as he's mad, I am glad. And that is the report that we want to maintain. Because if he's happy at what we're doing, then we, we are in trouble. The devil should never be comfortable around us as children of God. Never. I've been in church where demons came, sat down, and was singing beside the lady with the hymn book. The lady had the hymn book open, and the demon was there singing out of the hymn book with her. Where demons came in church, sat down comfortably. That should not be. Because light and darkness have no fellowship. Light and darkness have no fellowship. Light exposes darkness. And the devil should never at any point in our lives feel comfortable to come into our presence. Once we sense him, Paul even said, you don't have to see him. He says, shun every appearance of evil. We don't even have to see him. Once we smell him or, or even the thought of him coming should make him uncomfortable. And that is where God wants to take. That is where I want God to take me on greater levels than that. I don't know about you, but I want more of this. I want to increase in the anointing. I want more because I know what, what God wants of me. And if I don't do it, the, the, God has shown me what the devil intends to do. And I don't want to go back there. If you want to go back there, that's... that's I don't want to go back there because the Lord has warned me. He has warned me. Two weeks ago, I was sitting in, in here, apostle teaching, and he says, boy, I'm taking you back up. But he said, this time, come on, do it. And he said, don't, don't, let, don't let me down. And when God gives you that warning, when God says that to you, he says, I'm taking you up back. I'm going to put you back. I'm going to lift you up. But this time, it's going to be different. It's going to be different. And I have, I have seen what the devil can do. But I know what God can do to a life that is committed to him. And for years, I was bound by flesh, strongholds. But God delivered me. And I was thinking, oh, it's all right. You can just sin and ask God for forgiveness. He will forgive you. He loves you. He cares for you. You can just go. You can, after you sin, just go back and ask God for forgiveness. For 12 long years, I went through that mindset, that mentality. Until God revealed the truth to me in this ministry through the man of God, Apostle Richard Fagan. And that revelation brought something to me. And God said, do not go back there. I don't know how long you may have struggled with, you, with whatever you were struggling with. But to struggle with something for 12 years. Week in, week out. I lacked the power. I lack the power, but God came and gave me that power. And he says, now that I've given you this power, you walk in it. 
Do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. And the enemy came several times to draw me back there. But God wants to tell you today that there is power in the name of Jesus. I'm going to ask the praise team to come and help with this one. There is power in the name of Jesus. And if you believe in him, that power can manifest in your life. Because Jesus is not, is not coming back to die for sins again. It's either you get it now or you don't get it. But he's not coming back to die for sins again. He did it once and for all. And he said he wants that, that life to be demonstrated, that power to be demonstrated in us. There is power in the name of Jesus. Do you believe that? When you're, when you're singing this song, meditate on the words. Reflect on the words. And whatever the devil is saying to you, whatever situations or circumstances that are lingering around you, meditate on the word. Don't just sing it because you know the tune and the lyrics, but think on the word. There is power power in the name of Jesus there is power in the name of Jesus to break every chain to break every addiction to break everything that is coming against you there is power in the name of Jesus when, when you are singing meditate on the words think on the words even if you have to stop and just be out of tune and just don't 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 worry about what persons are saying don't, just just meditate on the word and listen to the words because there's a message in this for you power in the name of jesus there is power there is power Jesus to break every chain break every chain break every chain to break every chain break every chain yes break Hallelujah. every chain every single one there is power in the name of Jesus Every break every chain, break, break every chain. chain. There's not one chain that break you cannot every break. Chain. break. Doesn't every matter what chain. it is, break every chain. There's not one chain that the break blood of Jesus cannot break. Rising up, I want you to believe in that message. from that addiction from that thing that you keep falling back into and he said today can be the day I hear the chains falling I hear the chains Chains falling. And you hear the chains falling. 
Break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. Break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. Take it down a little. You know, um, sometimes you, you can be comfortable in a situation because you're thinking it's not as bad as other people's. You're not going out there, you're not fornicating, you're not committing adultery. It's not that bad. But that one thing, that one thing can be the difference between you get going into a greater anointing, a greater level of grace, or just staying where you are. That one thing can be the catalyst to propel you to greater levels in God. And if you are willing today, God can help you. Grace is available. Power is available to break that chain, to break that addiction. And if God is speaking to your heart, I, I don't know, I can't tell you what he's saying to you, but you know what he's saying to you. But you know where you are with it. So as we do that song one more time, and we're going to pray. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. If God, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. He wants to break those chains. Hallelujah. God is not into show. He's not into show. He's not into pretense. Supernatural power of God is available. Hallelujah.
anointed, fire and anointed, consume them, Lord, consume them, Father, consume them. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, set the captives free. In the name of Jesus, Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. in that freedom do not go back do not go back do not go back you may not know it but it took something to set you free it took warfare to set you free it took blood and sweat to set you free do not go back do not go back the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus. Yes, God. Yes, God. Yes, God. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, God. Yes, Lord. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, Lord, yes. Yes, God. It all belongs to you. Yes, God. Yes, God. Yes, God. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Give the Lord a praise. Hallelujah.
All my life I never knew this level of freedom. I never knew this level of freedom. I don't know if you understand, but to be controlled by sin, to be preaching and sin 12 years and, and, and just doing things and you, it seems you cannot control yourself. But thanks be to God who has set us free through Christ Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Thank you very much. You may be seated. We're going to release you shortly. God is good. God is good. Meditate on that. God is good. Father, we thank you for your goodness. Thank you. And Paul says it is the goodness of God that leads men to repentance. Thank you for your goodness, God. Thank you for grace. Thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Thank you. You are worthy. You are worthy. You are worthy. Thank you, Jesus. You are worthy. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Yes, 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 yes. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. That's what the Lord wants of you. That's what the Lord wants. Praise God. Praise God. All right, it's time to release you. The presence of God is so rich and sweet. Just want to stay in this presence and just worship Him. Praise God. God is good. Just keep meditating on the Word of God. Keep meditating on his word. And be mindful of what he wants you to do. Praise God. I just lift your hands if you want to. So an envelope will be given to you. Our ushers are going around. I want to thank those who are watching us online. You're watching Increase in Faith. Deliverance Ministries International and Pastor Alton Stevenson here declaring the gospel of the kingdom and God wants you to understand that the kingdom of God comes with power it's not just word but power and he wants that authority and that power to be demonstrated in your life there are some things that are happening in your life that you, 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 you don't know or you don't know why it, it's happening to you but we are here to tell you that there are forces working against you and the kingdom of God is what gives us that revelation and that understanding that there are forces working behind the scenes to destroy humanity but Jesus said I have come that you may have life and have it 
more abundantly. And he wants you to have that life. That life is not given to some as opposed to others. He says, whoever comes in him, whoever abides in him, whoever. So you might be saying you are far gone and it's too late. But if you hear his voice, if you are hearing his voice right now, you can make that shift. You can make that change. If you are hearing his voice right now, you can come into this. If he's speaking to you through his Holy Spirit and through us, through this medium, you can come into this. Praise God. So we want you to check out our book, The Gospel of the Kingdom, the message that Jesus preached. You may find it on Amazon.com. You can download it on your so Kindle on your device. It's the gospel of the kingdom, the message that Jesus preached. There are many things being preached out there which is not the gospel. They may title it as the gospel, but it's not the gospel. But we want you to know the gospel that Jesus preached. The message that he preached about the kingdom of God. That is what this book is about. So we want you to check it out. You can find it on Amazon and you can download it to your device. Just search Richard Fagan at Amazon.com and you'll see the book pop up there and you can download it. If you're close in our vicinity, we are in um, Montego Bay, St. James, 3 E Street, Montego Bay. You can call us and we have copies here we can um, supply you with. So we give God thanks for that. Also, if you want to see our live teachings, if you want to see our live teachings, you can check us out on Facebook, Richard Fagan at Facebook.com. And also you'll see our live teachings there. You can see our teachings on um, Sundays, Tuesdays, Tuesdays, 10.30 to 1.30, and Wednesdays and Fridays, 8 6 30 to 8 30 and on saturdays we have from 10 to 1. so you can check out that there and also if you want to see our recordings perhaps you did not get to watch it live if you want to see the recordings at your own convenience you can check us out at youtube at richard fake and at youtube and you'll see where more scriptures are added there so that you can edify and build up your faith build up your faith in the lord also you can check out our website at www.increasingfaith intl.org so you can check out our website there and if you want to contact um, us directly you can contact uh, Apostle Fagan, Richard Fagan at 876-839-9390 that's 876-839-9390 or 557-2427 we look forward to hearing from you Together we can do more than a part. And God wants us to work together. So if God has put it upon your heart to sow into this ministry or to connect with us, to, to obey God is better than sacrifice. So you, you, you must obey God. You should obey God. We implore you to obey God. Because obeying God will open a, a different level of anointing and understanding and revelation to you that you would not get if you weren't obedient to him. So we invite you to walk with us, to connect with us if God has so laid it on your heart. And trust me, your life will never be the same. No one comes in contact with Jesus Christ and whom he has sent and remain the same. That is the truth. That is the gospel. And that is what we preach day in and day out. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. You've been blessed today. Praise God. Give thanks for those who are here. With God bless you. Thank you for taking the time out to be with us. Praise God. Thank you for participating in the worship. And I trust that God would have ministered to your hearts. Continue to walk in truth. Continue to abide in him. Because it is in doing this that you see greater manifestation of the life of God in our lives. Praise God. All right, I'm going to invite you to stand. Everyone has sown already. Praise God. We invite you to stand as we um, bring this service to a close. Father, we thank you for grace. Thank you for your anointing. Thank you for your covering. Thank you for what you have done for us today, God. And those who you have set free. And Jesus said, whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Thank you, Father. 
Thank you, Lord. And we praise you. Hallelujah. Continue to release grace and increase us in grace. Increase us in the anointing. Increase us, God, in the glory. Increase us in revelation and in understanding of your word that we may be able to impart more and more and more will be drawn in, Father, so that your house will be full and your people will come in, God, as those you have appointed for this in Jesus' name we pray and give you the praise, the glory, the honor. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you his peace. God bless you. In Jesus' name, praise God.